Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles DeHart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles DeHart. Welcome, guys and gals, to the Mobile Home Park Investing Weekly Podcast, where we'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bopp, and in today's show, we're going to be speaking with founder and president of Rock USA, Paul Bradley. Rock USA LLC is a nonprofit social venture that makes resident ownership of manufactured home communities viable and successful nationwide. Rock USA operates through a network of nine nonprofit technical assistance providers and a subsidiary, CDFI, Rock USA Capital. These network affiliates have preserved over 14,500 affordable homes in 224 communities in 15 states. Rock USA Capital has delivered more than $200 million of financing since 2009. Now, guys, I'm very much looking forward to having Paul here on the show today so that we can better understand the uh, significant value that he and his organization bring to our industry. And so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Paul Bradley to the show. Paul, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, Kevin. Good to be with you. Yes, thanks for joining us here. And so first and foremost, Paul, maybe take a few minutes. And for those that aren't familiar with you, that aren't familiar with your organization, um, fill in the gaps for me. Tell us more about yourself, your background, and also about Rock, if you would. Uh, You bet. So um, I got in the industry in 1988, began working with homeowners in mobile home parks and helping them purchase them as co-ops starting in October of 1988. And honestly, uh, fell absolutely in love with the industry and with the homeowners taking ownership. Worked in New Hampshire for 20 years and then founded Rock USA to scale the resident ownership work we've been doing in New Hampshire across the country. And so since 2008, we have expanded to uh, now 16 states. Since the bio was sent to you, Mm -hmm. uh, we've closed on a transaction in Colorado, our 16th state with co op and uh, now close to 15,000 homeowners. So it's really a, it's a, a model that was very, has been very successful in New Hampshire. You know, we saw the opportunity to uh, begin scaling it across the country. And, you know, at first there were questions about that, of course. You know, you know New Hampshire has a barn raising, community barn raising kind of tradition. Will that be of interest to people in other parts of the country? And and the jury's no longer out. So whether you're in Texas or, or uh, Washington State or Montana or where have you, uh, mm-hmm. homeowners, homeowners want control of the land under their homes. Got it, got it. And I, I'm assuming that there's, I know there's a few states, I don't know how many, that actually do have a, uh, I, b- I believe, a statewide requirement that in communities, they have to give the residents the, uh, the first right of refusal to purchase that, that community prior to it being sold to a private owner. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, there are five states with, okay. with uh, that reg- requirement. Four of them are in New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. The fifth is in Oregon. And a soft version of it exists in a couple of other states, most, most notably uh, Florida. Hmm. Do you find that you have a lot more traction in those type of states uh, where it's a, uh, somewhat of a requirement? Yeah, in states where there's opportunity to purchase legislation, such as uh, those five, you know, for sure, homeowners are given notice that the community is for sale and are given an opportunity to negotiate for the purchase. And given that resident ownership is is not, not well known in the business as a as a exit strategy, it certainly helps uh, put everybody on notice that the homeowners uh, have that opportunity and. And when there's an entrepreneurial nonprofit with capital and know-how that can react and, and support the group in that short timetable, uh, that, that really matters. Um, mm-hmm. So we, certainly in those five states, we are that entrepreneurial nonprofit to saddle up with the homeowners. Okay. But the majority of our states, as I said, we're in 16 at present. Yeah. You know, so in 11 states, we're, we're just out introducing ourselves to community operators who are increasingly actually finding us. Uh, which is great. Much easier when they find us as opposed to us <laughs> finding them. 
Sure, sure. Give us a little bit of the uh, the, the history of the the co op. I mean, uh, you know, back when this industry started, that that wasn't. Well, maybe it was. Maybe, maybe you'll correct me, but I, I don't believe the industry started first and foremost with that co op model. And so maybe you can give us a little bit of the, the history of it to to paint additional color to it. Oh, you bet, Kevin. No, the industry didn't start there. I've run into over the years some early. 1980s and late 1970s HOA purchases that did take place. They tend to be isolated, and you know it's obviously a developer owner who who saw that as a as a exit strategy they wanted to learn a lot about and execute on, which was great for them. But uh, the first co-op in New Hampshire uh, was in 1984, and it was the Meredith Center Cooperative, and this was a you know a small community, 13 homes plus a site built. The owners lived in the site-built home, and an elderly gentleman needed to go to the nursing home, but his wife wanted to stay in the single-family home with a lifetime lease. And like a lot of small communities, you know, they, were thir- they, they had built over time 13 manufactured home pads in their backyard. So it was all one parcel. Um, and they, you know, the, the homeowners in the community were their neighbors. So they, everybody knew that they needed to sell in order for him to go to the nursing home. You know, so the homeowners did what a lot of people would do. They one by one went down to the local bank, asked for a loan to buy the community, and they heard each of them, well, you don't have any experience, you don't have any equity, I'm sorry, we can't finance your purchase. But uh, lo and behold, there was a sister of one of the residents who had a friend who was going to graduate school, and uh, she showed up in class one day and posed the situation to her professor who said, well, why don't they buy it as a co-op? And there's a new nonprofit starting in New Hampshire called the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. Uh, They could finance the purchase. And so literally, uh, the day of the closing, the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund borrowed $38,000 from the Sisters of Mercy, Catholic Order of Nuns, and turned around and financed the co-op with $38,000. And it was the, the community loan fund's first loan and the first resident-owned community in the state. And the founding president of the community loan fund at the time said, well, this is great. This was really cool. And we helped these folks out. And she went on to do other things, you know, nonprofit child care lending, food co-op lending, small business lending. But uh, a, a, an article ran in the newspaper and her phone just exploded with interest people, uh, homeowners and community owners interested in this resident ownership model. And so that's what led her to hire staff and uh, hire this young college graduate in, in 1988 to take on the program, which is what hmm. I did. Very interesting. So are there other programs out there that do similar things to you? I mean, are there a multitude of other operators out there or organizations that do what you do there at Rock? So no other nonprofits are in this space. We developed a national organization in 2008, as you said, with with the affiliates uh, or an affiliate model. So we have nonprofits that are under agreement with us. They provide boots on the ground training and education uh, and market development in their states and and regions. And then we provide, you know, some of the national know-how and tools and templates as well as the financing. So we've scaled the scaled the national services, and then uh, still have a in the community, you know, shaking hands with the community operator approach to the business through our affiliate network. Let's talk about that a little bit as far as that, the formation of that co-op and the, the operation of it, kind of the handing off of it to the residents. You know, in theory, it sounds easy, right? Well, let's just buy this. Let's kind of band together as brothers and sisters and let's, ban, let's buy this community, right? Let, let's, let's, keep it, let's keep it as our own. And now you've got the logistics involved of, of managing an HOA, managing a budget and managing essentially what is a business. And so how, how do you guys handle that process as far as the uh, you know, uh, continual training and support that I'm assuming a lot of these communities need, uh, you know, as they, as they uh, move into this resident-owned model? Yeah, well, it's, it's very interesting. So first, I would say the model, uh, the ownership model is incredibly resilient in and of itself. Keep in mind, we only work in low-income neighborhoods. We are a nonprofit and the IRS ensures that we only work in communities that serve more than 80% low-income folks by federal definition. 
Uh, so we're not out dealing just in, we're not dealing in luxury communities or A plus properties with golf courses. Mm-hmm. Um, we're dealing in certainly some A properties, but a lot of B properties and some C properties and even a few D properties. But through our, our now 35 years of experience in New Hampshire and now nationally, and a total of 228 co ops, not one of those co ops has ever resold filed for bankruptcy, faced foreclosure, or otherwise lost their property, which is really a pretty remarkable standard for any commercial asset class, let alone one owned and managed by low and moderate income homeowners on a democratic basis. So the model in and of itself and the strength of the ownership by the homeowners is is itself really strong. But we absolutely are committed. We spend the bulk of our training budget post-purchase. So for instance, we have a National Leadership Institute at Southern New Hampshire University. We bring, uh, this summer, we'll bring 100 co-op leaders from across the country for three days of leadership development training. Mm. We do that on a regional basis. And then there's training and education by affiliates uh, within each community as well. We have uh, an online, and no surprise, we have a uh, an intranet for co-op members. We have over a thousand subscribers that uh, are involved in discussion groups and not enough yet online training, but certainly an area we want to invest a lot more in. Hmm. So there is a strong commitment to ongoing training and education and support. But again, these are pretty resilient communities in and of themselves. Yeah, that's fantastic. One, you know, one of the questions which you kind of answered is, uh, have you, you know, ha- have you seen a resident-owned community um, basically go into default, uh, you know, run into a distress situation or bankruptcy or essentially revert back to private ownership? And the question originated from a industry article that I saw very recently. Um, you know, Sam Zell with ELS, they purchased a community over in West Palm Beach, Florida, um, very high-end community. I think it traded for over $100,000 per lot. I think it was a three or 400 space park, you know, high-end community, what I classify as a lifestyle, you know, age-restricted community. So not necessarily affordable housing in the sense of the word, but, uh, you know, that obviously was a resident-owned community that reverted back. And so um, I just, I was, I was going to ask you, has that ever happened to you? You answered the question, no. But ultimately, when is that in the, the resident's best interest to potentially revert back um, to private ownership? Yeah, I, I read about that case. I uh, heard some from the from some members of that co-op uh, subsequent to the sale, and we've seen it in other non what I consider non network co-op deals. Recognize, you know, where our national network represents two hundred and twenty eight co-ops. There are roughly a thousand manufactured housing community co-ops in the country, primarily in Florida, but uh, sprinkled throughout uh, the country. You'll find mm-hmm. some in California. And, and in new markets, we enter, you know, in Washington State, and for instance, there are, there are some uh, older co-ops there. So in, in, in Massachusetts, some older co-ops. But the reasons I think, you know, some co-ops may revert is they, they do run into challenges. And, you know, in this business, when the transaction was supported by consultants and lawyers who got paid handsome fees at closing, but there was no consideration of how the leaders of the community would be supported over time. Um, and therefore, they become islands and, the, you know, co-op, uh, isolated co-ops, co-ops, uh, islands, and they can fall into any number of, of problems. You know, in any business, you would invest in leadership development. Mm-hmm. And the same is true in these communities. And this is, as a general rule, these are not community leaders that have professionally been provided leadership development opportunities. So I think it's, it's a, it speaks to the need for creating a system of the communities uh, or a network of the communities. And further, what, what's so infuriating, frankly, Kevin, down in Florida, you know, where you, you've got 600 to 700 co-ops in the state. No one's capitalizing on the aggregation opportunities that exist for those co-op communities. It's, it's uh it's an opportunity to aggregate the demand coming out of those neighborhoods. And it's, it's frustrating because co-ops are based on the whole concept of group buying and aggregation at the end of the day. And so when you mean aggregate, you mean from a, from a support mechanism, actually putting the support infrastructure in place? 
support mechanisms, but also demand for goods and services, you know, mm. be it property management, be it new homes, be it uh, any variety of, could be water meters, uh, you know, any variety of, of resources that these communities consume, just like any, you know, sort of like the purchasing platform that, you know, you'll see in, in investment, investor owned communities, there's aggregation opportunities here. Certainly we see them, we've leveraged a few of them, but you know, there's a, there's definitely size matters in that aggregation business. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's where, you know, we certainly have our sites set on. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, Paul just gave you a business idea. So hopefully uh, <laughs> in any event, I want to talk about it from a park owner's perspective, a seller's perspective, a private owner's uh, perspective, the value that uh, that rock can bring uh, to those types of folks you know, that are looking for a, a alternate exit strategy. Let's talk about that side of the business a little bit and uh, maybe just give me um, some insight to what that transaction looks like and who is that ideal seller? Like who is the seller to where, you know, essentially makes more sense or is a a better opportunity to work with uh, Rock versus working with us, you know, to sell to another private operator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the sellers that uh, we work with are, you know, small and medium-sized individuals and companies that, you know, are transacting, you know, one, two or three properties at a time. They uh, have expectations about commercial timeframes and we've built our entire uh, acquisition process around commercial timeframes. It's standard due diligence. Um, So you'll you'll see quotes from community operators that have sold to the residents who actually talk about it as an easier process than selling to some third parties because we we work for the buyers, let's be very clear, and we're very good at what we do. And the, the seller's experience is in a co-op purchase situation, the, the seller's not being badgered with uh, any extraordinary requests for information. And the homeowners have an interest in getting the thing done and getting it done efficiently. So there's just not a lot of, a lot of hair on a lot of these deals. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but we, we're very cognizant, uh, you know, of sellers' expectations that uh, this not be dragged out, that um, if it's a viable transaction, it goes through the process and gets gets closed, you know, 120 days, 90 to 120 days after contract. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you talked about like uh, small to medium-sized communities. What what does that really mean um, to, to Rock? Uh, I mean, can you give me an idea of like typical size range of, uh, you know, uh, you know, 40 spaces on the low side? Uh, and then, you know, what's your largest community? Just to, again, give some, you know, paint some color for the listeners as, right. you know, really what your model looks like from an acquisition side. Yeah. And I meant to say operators, if I said communities, uh, you know, tend to be, we tend to not get many opportunities coming out of the large consolidators because mm-hmm. the properties get sold in very large portfolios and we're not at a point where we can, can uh, dis- deconsolidate effectively sure. <laughs> large, large portfolios. But uh, with medium-sized operators and smaller operators that are doing single transactions, we're very good at. The range of size, the smallest co-op is four units. The largest in our national network is uh, 430 units. Okay. The largest transaction was $29 million. We closed that a year and a half ago. And so everything in, <laughs> when you talk about four, you're talking, you know, difference between 125,000 to 29 million. But our, you know, our average size transactions about 3 million bucks. Uh, mm-hmm. Average size co-ops about 75 units. You know, as I said, A, B, and C properties primarily. We do have a few affiliates with a development capacity to take on uh, D properties and obviously have the wherewithal to, to, to work with a community through the process of, of uh, essentially rebuilding and repositioning that property. Got it. I know you mentioned you're in 16 states, but uh, geographically speaking, are there limitations as far as demographics such as a population of that MSA, you know, the economic base or employer base in that area? I mean, do you look at those factors as well when making your, uh, you know, consideration to acquire a community? You know, you know, Kevin, not as much as some investors, perhaps. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, we're looking at the individual community uh, and the length of the length of tenure of the homeowners. You know, mm-hmm. where there are homeowners that are invested in the neighborhood, they've been there for a period of time, or, or you know, at least a percent a percentage of them have been there for a, a period of time. 
then, you know, and they're interested and they see opportunity in preserving it, then we're going to be there with them. Got it. We're probably, we're not uh, pricing in, you know, any opportunities for infill or expansion uh, in mm-hmm. those situations for sure. But um, if it's a motivated group of homeowners and there's, there's, uh, they're confident about their futures there, uh, that's a pres- preservation opportunity. And, and, and again, I'm, just, I'm trying to educate the listeners that might have communities, as you know, considering you as a uh, potential exit uh, for their, their properties. And so park-owned homes, we know that's a, you know, that's a necessary evil sometimes in communities. We own communities where we, we own none of the homes. We don't prefer that business model, but we happen to own a lot of homes because we acquire them through the, you know, the acquisitions where the old, old owner might have operated it in a manner to where a percentage were park owned units. And so um, how do you guys manage that as far as a, a potential acquisition? If it's got some park owned homes, is it still, you know, made a consideration to, to acquire it? Yeah, we're looking primarily at communities with fewer than 25% park owned homes. Okay. We have done some deals with portfolios of contract for deed homes where uh, we'll acquire, uh, where the co-op will acquire the, the contracts and uh, we'll create a refinance opportunity with a local credit union to get those folks into better financing, mm-hmm. general rule, better financing and uh, transition those to traditional mortgages or or chattel loans. Okay. But, um, and we can, and we do finance those portfolios of contract for deed homes. Um, and the same is true with, with park owned homes. Those can be financed as a separate asset and our work with the co-op would transition those to uh, home ownership as quickly as possible. Yep. Got it. Uh, yeah. Cause this got is it. a, it's a home ownership model, you know? Mm-hmm. So in the case of a hundred percent rental, Kevin, we wouldn't even uh, sure. Uh, neither would, not, would we. <laughs> we would not pass go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. Neither would we. Uh, it's, some people love that model. Not so much myself. Yeah. yeah uh, it's a flat apartment house. It's a different business. That, exactly. You're apartment. exactly right. And so, Paul, what other relevant information have have we not covered uh, that you feel would be good for our listeners to know about you, your organization, how you guys operate, uh, any of the above? Yeah. Well, I could describe the purchase process a little bit further by saying, we are very active in the industry. We talk with a lot of community operators who want to have a confidential conversation about whether their community is a viable resident ownership opportunity. I just had a, a call in New York from a very sophisticated investor, a finance guy in New York, and he had a, he has a beautiful property. He had heard from the homeowners over the years that they wanted to purchase it whenever he was ready to sell. And so out of respect for the homeowners, he, you know, did some due diligence. He looked into us and he called and he said, look, you know, I'm, I'm happy to sell to the homeowners. I just want to know that it's a viable transaction. And if I open the door that you guys can get this thing done with them. And so, you know, we did some of our own due diligence on it and looked at the, looked at the property and the numbers and went back to him and said, yeah, this is a viable opportunity at this price. So we brought with his permission and, and we only go and meet with the homeowners, with the community owner's permission. We went and introduced ourselves, we introduced the, the process and they uh, resoundingly at the first meeting said, absolutely, we want to purchase the community. They saw the, they know the market they're in. They saw the risks to themselves if they didn't. And, um, and that's moving forward. Uh, and that's a $10 million transaction, but you know, he put us through our paces. You know, he, he said he did a lot of research on us before he even picked up the phone. And, uh, and in that back and forth during the, during that uh, initial stage, you know, he had a lot of tough questions and, you know, was satisfied that he, that he got the answers he needed. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming that, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the price, and, and I know that it's not a closed transaction, so we can't really discuss those details, but uh, the, the price that he's going to yield from selling it to, uh, to, to Rock is probably very similar to what he would have on the, the private market. I, I'm, I'm going to make that assumption. Um, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. I mean, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the reality of it. We have to compete Sure, and, and it's really, and a lot of times we're educating homeowners as to what the market looks like. So it's great that, you know, um, yourself and, uh, and others are out there talking about how the industry operates, what the cap rates are, uh, what the investment climate is, what's the, the, the cash inflows coming into this, into this sector are, because, you know, homeowners need that, uh, they need to do their own research and come to understand, you know, what they're, 
uh, what the outlook is. Um, mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, what, another interesting part of our due diligence process that some investors are very interested in is, well, how do the homeowners who form this co-op have the money to act quickly? That's a great um, one. Yeah, we missed that. Yeah. No, and, and, uh, and we have a very unique approach to it that um, if I said it was available to investors, my phone would ring off the hook, believe me. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> and that is we provide a forgivable due diligence loan to the co-op once they get organized so that they can hire a lawyer, so they have independent representation. They can uh, hire a civil engineer for the property conditions report, of course, an appraiser. Uh, later comes a site survey and environmental site assessment, as you know. But um, we provide the forgivable pre-development loan so that they get access to all the information they need to make an informed decision to purchase. We do that uh, very early on. And if, and if ultimately, you know, a bad PCR comes back and we just can't, can't bridge it in any way, and we're pretty darn good at it, then if the transaction doesn't go forward, we actually write off those due diligence dollars. Uh, which, which you know about because you're an investor and you put your own money up when you're doing due diligence. But for a group of low-income homeowners getting together, they don't have those resources. So yeah. we, we make that happen for them. But remarkably, in my, my 30 years of doing this, uh, we've written off less than 5%. Uh, wow, that's fantastic. Due diligence financing. Yeah, the reality is everybody's motivated. You know this in business. Everybody's motivated to get the transaction done. We find a way to get it done. Even if there's a you know a septic system issue, which we got going on right now, and in, in a Vermont deal, or uh, or um, you know any variety of things that come up, I was going to ask you: Do, do you have a uh, do you have an issue with private septic systems, or or, or you know wastewater treatment plants, or wells, private water systems? Uh, it doesn't sound like you do. It sounds like as long as it's operating as it should, everything's in compliance. That um, that you'll consider just about any type of infrastructure arrangement. Correct. Yeah, we don't have a problem with public water or private uh, or public or private septic sewer. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I love septic system technology personally. But, really, I've never heard uh, anyone say that before in my life. I think it's the most <laughs> cost- I joke actually around here because I, I, I I've become the se- I'm the septic system expert when it comes to. The well, I'm most- calling you next time we have an issue. No. <laughs> ah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's that's quite funny. Um, in any event, well, well, Paul, this has been absolutely a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate you, you coming on the show here, and for for the folks that have an interest in learning more about, you know, what it is you guys have going on there at Rock USA, what's the best place to send them? I'd send them right to our website, rocusa.org. That's uh, rocusa.org. There is no uh, hyphen in that; just uh, straight rocusa. Okay, fantastic. And as we round out the show here, Paul, I go into the the last segment, which is what I call the Mobile Home Park Words of Wisdom. And so you've already shared a lot of uh, great information here today, lots of wisdom, lots of gold nuggets. But if you had just, you know, one final uh, last word of wisdom that you can leave with our listeners that may inspire and motivate them as they progress in their mobile home park investing career, what would that be? I think my my word of wisdom would come from having worked with thousands of homeowners at this point in my career, you have in your communities some extraordinary people with with real capacity. And, you know, co-ops are one solution, but I just urge everyone to, as I know many community operators do, just really respect the, the homeowners that live in your communities. At the end of the day, these folks have worked darn hard to secure home ownership. You know, it's not what everybody thinks of when they think of home ownership, but I think we need to be really clear as an industry that we provide home ownership mm-hmm. um, and that home ownership is a good thing. People need security. People need an asset that that grows in value and supports their families. You know, net worth needs, and I think there's no no question that you know, we have a, a large population of of households that really need a, a housing at a price point that they that they can clearly afford and it's it's escaping us um, yeah. and it's hurting it's hurting a lot of people so there's a lot of respect in this uh, for homeowners and a lot of a lot of need uh, out mm-hmm. there so well, that's fantastic one last question I did have Paul before we uh, say goodbye to one another is what is that you know I'm assuming if we go to your website uh, being a park owner we could probably make an inquiry or you probably have a process that's outlined as far as you know putting 
your community up for consideration or you know, getting on the phone and having a conversation with you. But what is the, the normal time frame, you know, of evaluation before you can make a, a just a you know high level determination of whether or not you might have an interest in pursuing a seller's community? Well, I urge our our team on the acquisitions front, uh, our national acquisitions managers, Angela Romeo. She is extraordinary. She um, will deal with things very quickly. I urge our team to uh, that a that a a quick no is uh, preferred to a slow no, and a, a solid yes is needs to come as quickly as possible. So <laughs> we do not like slow no's. Uh, I think that's the worst thing you can do in business is provide a slow no. Uh, so a pretty quick yeah. assessment. Angela will do that right up front, and if it's a no go, she'll tell you. Um, okay. If it's if it's a maybe, let's, can we have a week or two to work at this? Then you're going to hear that. Um, and if it's a yes, this is this is a star. Uh, we're going to charge at this with everything that we got. Um, you'll hear yeah. that. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. And guys, thank you for joining us here today on the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. And until we meet again next week, you guys make it a great one. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.